I joined, I went back to Berkeley and I decided to join in January and then in March I was initiated. So that was the next time I was able to see Srila Prabhupada at the same temple on La Cienega. That was 1970 in March and the initiation was very interesting. What happened was there were a number of devotees being initiated. The devotee on my right, who was initiated as Paramatma, used to smoke cigarettes. The devotee on my left, who was initiated as Babrubahan, used to take a lot of LSD. So when it came time for them to recite the four regulative principles, they would recite them and then Paramatma on my right, Prabhupada, after he recited the regulative principles, Prabhupada went like this. And he said, what about smoking? And he said, oh no, Prabhupada. So then I recited the regulative principles. Prabhupada gave me my name. He said, Mahatma is one who's always chanting the glories of the Lord. He didn't say anything else. Then it came time for Babrubahan. He recited the, the four regulative principles and Prabhupada said, what about LSD? And he, of course, said, oh no, Prabhupada. So it was, it's funny, they don't remember that. I distinctly remember that to this day. I don't know if the temple presidents told Prabhupada that they had those habits or if Prabhupada knew it. Generally, we assume that he just knew. But I thought that was amazing that he made those remarks. And he was kind of laughing and smiling and pretending like he was smoking. The nice thing about being temple president in the early days is we were supposed to write Prabhupada a letter every month. We were supposed to tell him what was going on in our center and then I could take advantage and ask questions. So one time we were doing traveling sankirtan and I was enjoying traveling and preaching. I didn't like to manage. So when I came back to the temple I was experiencing all this anxiety. So I began thinking that on the road I can remember Krishna. But when I'm at the temple I just forget him. There's so many things to do. So, I decided when I would give my report to Srila Prabhupada that I would ask a question. So I was thinking like this. I was thinking, is it better to do less service and think of Krishna more or do more service and think of Krishna less? So those are my two options, although that's not the actual philosophy. So I wrote Prabhupada that letter. What should I do? Because I told him how when I was traveling it was so much easier to think of Krishna. So then... He replied, his first sentence was, the whole point of everything is to become absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. So when I heard Prabhupada say that, I felt guilty, I felt embarrassed, I felt this was impossible to become absorbed in thoughts of Krishna because I felt I was never thinking of Krishna. That's why I wrote Prabhupada, thinking of so many things other than Krishna. So he writes back, the whole point of everything is to become absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. And I, so I was, or, or immediately I was thinking, this is impossible. I'm already at loss, at a loss. So then Prabhupada said, the way you do this is that you think that you have no qualification for your service. So Prabhupada told me in my situation, you should think that you have no qualification to be the temple president and that you have to pray to Krishna to give you the qualification. So he said, you should think Krishna, you should pray, Krishna, please give me the qualifica qualification because if you don't give me the qualification, then all the devotees in the temple will leave. So he said, in that way, always remain dependent on Krishna and then you'll always be able to think of Krishna. So he didn't say, do less service, think of Krishna more. That was never Prabhupada's mood. But his mood was, you should be dependent. And then by being dependent, you'll think of Krishna. So I thought that was very instructive. So he had gone from Vancouver to all the towns between Vancouver and Edmonton and we had spent most of our time in Calgary and Edmonton and we, we had amazing response because no one knew what the Hare Krishna movement was. We were on TV, we were on radio, we were just young devotees, 19, 20 years old, very enthusiastic. And there was a large Hindu community and we did programs with the Hindus. We were staying in two people's homes, we were doing Sunday feasts in their homes, getting 50, 60 people. Devotees were joining there, Ganapati Maharaj, we first met him there and other devotees. So it was a phenomenal program, plus we were distributing Krishna books. So I wrote a letter to the devotees in Vancouver describing all the events. Of, it was such an ecstatic Sankirtan party. And then the devotees took that letter and they sent it to Prabhupada. And um, actually I sent that letter to my wife and 
I had a ward on my foot, which I'd had since I was 13. So at that time I was about 21. So she sent the letter to Prabhupada, and then she also asked him, do you have a cure for warts? Because at that time, devotees had that relationship where they were dependent on Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was in the pharmaceutical business. So a lot of times he would give us cures, and then we would also ask him for cures. So I had this wart since I was 13. And it was cut out many, many times, burned out. It would continually grow back. I just forgot about it. When I came back from that trip, the ward had gone. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, somehow or other it's gone. And then she later told me, said, you know, when I sent that letter to Prabhupada, I asked him for a cure for warts. And somehow, this is a true story, somehow or other that ward disappeared, whether it was by chance or Prabhupada did it, that we can try to understand, but I took it that somehow or Prabhupada did that. So that was an interesting pastime. And it never came back. Never came back. In the summer of 71, all the devotees from Vancouver went to the Rathiatra in San Francisco, and Prabhupada was there as well. And because I was a temple president, I was told that in the evening there was going to be a temple president's meeting. And I had, to this point, I had never been alone not alone, but I'd never been with Prabhupada in an intimate setting. I'd only seen him giving class. I don't think at this point I'd even been on a morning walk. So the whole day of Rathiatra, I was thinking, what is this temple president's meeting? Is it some type of managerial meeting where there's going to be policies and strategies, like a corporate meeting? And so I was wondering all day. And that was the basic impression I had of a managerial meeting, and Prabhupada's going to set some policies and standards, show us how to take care of our books, organize, and so forth. So it wasn't anything like that at all. When we got into the room, as we were coming in one by one, Prabhupada gave us some prasadam off his plate, some dried fruit and nuts. But then he sat us down, and then the whole time he preached to us about preaching and opening more centers, because the mood in those days was to open centers. Prabhupada wanted 108 centers to be opened. So even more than book distribution, I think, at that time, opening centers was the, the focus. So he was preaching to us about opening centers, and the devotees were telling Prabhupada what they had done. And he was preaching to us about preaching, the importance of preaching and enthusing us and, and preaching to us. And that was the temple president's meeting, was Prabhupada preaching to us about preaching. And devotees telling Prabhupada about their preaching. And Prabhupada not talking about any details of the preaching other than, yes, open up more centers, preach, spread Krishna consciousness. So I thought that was very amazing. And then in my other experiences with, with Prabhupada, I was always interested in seeing how Prabhupada would manage because we have to manage a society and there are different styles of management. And I always wondered, how did Prabhupada manage the movement? You know, because generally you have the conception of a manager, especially of an international society, of someone with many secretaries, three or four telephones, big desks, and so many things. So every time I was with Prabhupada, no management was going on. He was just preaching. I, of course, I wasn't a GBC, but still, at least in my own experience with Prabhupada, there was never a time I was with him that he was rushing, um, as we may tend to do, on the phone, this emergency, that emergency. He had a totally different way of dealing with things, basically, as we know, through the mail. And every time I was with Prabhupada, he was either hearing about Krishna or preaching to devotees. And I, was, I would sit with him and I would think, how is Prabhupada managing this international society? Because every time I'm with him, he's always preaching. And it, he's not even talking about any of the problems and he's not talking about management. And I was always just awestruck by the potency that Prabhupada had. When uh, I was temple president in Vancouver, as I said, I was able to write Prabhupada. So at that time I was thinking we should form a rock band because we, if we had a rock band, if we became famous, we would have influence over the young people. And I was imagining us playing and converting people to Krishna consciousness and making so much money at concerts that everyone who came to the concert would get a book. So I wrote Prabhupada a letter and I said, you know, these, these rock stars, they have influence over the way young people think. They can totally change the way people are thinking. So what if we start a rock band to, and try to become famous and then we can preach through that? So Prabhupada wrote me a letter, interesting letter. He said, this trying to become famous is all phantasmagoria. He said, you'll never become famous. 
<laughs> he said, this is totally impractical. Why even try for it? He said, uh, he said we don't want to become famous ourselves. He said, we want to make Krishna famous. And he said, if you want to do music, then use your musical ability to lead ecstatic kirtans in the temple in Vancouver. But don't try to become famous yourself. So when I wrote Prabhupada, I was thinking, at least at that time, I wasn't thinking of wanting to become famous. I was thinking, if we became famous, we could use that for preaching. But actually, before I was a devotee, I had a very strong desire to become famous as a musician. So actually, the, Prabhupada saw that. It was very clear that he saw that. I actually didn't realize that, that if that wasn't one of my motives, it certainly would have become my motive or I would have been adversely influenced by it. So that was Prabhupada's reply. Knowing exactly where I was at, he said, don't try to become famous. You'll never become famous. We don't want to become famous. And so he shattered. So after that, I totally ever forgot that desire of becoming famous, which was actually quite a strong desire before I was a devotee. That was one of my aspirations. So uh, some morning walks, there is a picture that many devotees will remember where I'm, sit I'm standing behind Prabhupada, Ridai Nanamarsh is there, Dhanavir Prabhu is there, uh, many, many other senior devotees are there, and, Prabhupada, and we're all laughing. Trivikram Swami is there. Everybody's laughing, bursting out laughing. That, there, that shot is there in Your Ever Well Wisher. It's a still, and it was also published in BTG. So what were, what were we all laughing about? So we were walking in Santa Monica, uh, just north of the pier, and Ramachandra was describing book distribution in South America, how people were, they were getting letters from people who had received books, who were, who were appreciating books, who were living in places where there were no temples. So he was very impressed by that, that book distribution had gone so far and wide throughout South America that even people were getting books where there were no temples. So he was just glorifying Ridai Nanamaraj. Just going on, just see Ridai Nanamaraj's potency, he's enthusing book distribution, he's so wonderful. And Tamal Krishnamaraj was, I believe, Tam, yeah, Tamal Krishnamaraj was there. And as we know, it, that was 1976, that was the height of the competition with Radha Damodar and the other temples. The Prabhupada had incited this very fierce competition and Tamal Krishnamaraj wanted to be number one and Prabhupada knew that, that he wanted to be number one. So, as Ramachandra was going on glorifying Prabhupada, uh, glorifying Ridai Nanamaraj again and again and again. Prabhupada stopped and said, don't speak so loudly, Tamal will have a heart attack. And everyone just cracked up. And that's that picture. And Prabhupada himself was laughing. On another morning walk, this was on Venice Beach, uh, right around the area where we have Rathiyatra. And I think Dr. Stilson Judah was on that morning walk, and Bahulasa was presenting Christian arguments. So he said, Srila Prabhupada, one of the arguments is that no one has seen God. Something that says in the Bible, I believe, no one has seen God. Something to that effect. And Prabhupada stopped and he said, No fool has seen God. He said, I am not a fool like you. I have seen God. So at, at another time in San Francisco, this was 1972, Prabhupada was giving, uh, had met another man, a scientist. And I wasn't at the darshan, but the next morning in class, Prabhupada was kind of joking about the darshan he had with this man. He said, last night I met an atheistic scientist and I called him a rascal. And Prabhupada was laughing. He said, I called him a rascal. And Prabhupada said, and he admitted it. And then Prabhupada said, I can do this. He said, but you cannot do this. I observed many things about Prabhupada that showed his, as I was saying, his transcendental ability to manage. In Los Angeles, and Prabhupada introduced the Srimad Bhagavatam class, where, where he would chant Jai Radha Madhava, and then we would chant the verse. And actually, he wanted us to learn the verses. He wanted us to learn how to pronounce Sanskrit. That's why he introduced that. He actually, when he first introduced it, I believe it was in maybe 1970, 71, he was teaching the devotees how to pronounce and he was correcting them. So, at that time, this, the, the program was that Prabhupada would chant Jai Radha Manava, we would chant the verse, and he would let a lot of devotees chant, and he would give class. And after every class, he would have kirtan, without fail. Bhagavatam class, then kirtan. And in those days, 
when he would chant Jai Radha Madhava, all the devotees would get up and dance and jump in the air in ecstasy. It was, it was a very ecstatic thing. And then he would have the class. So, and then he would have the, the kirtan. So the thing that I'd notice is that Prabhupada always, every day, was always there. He never missed. And it was never like, today we're not having the kirtan because Prabhupada has an appointment or he has to do this, he has to go to the doctor. So Prabhupada's, you, you continue the kirtan, Prabhupada's going to skip out. Or Prabhupada wanted to take the morning walk a little bit longer so class will start later. And oftentimes on the morning walk, the devotees would say, we should turn back now, and Prabhupada would say, no, well, in a little while. It seemed like he just knew. He had the perfect timing, and then, then he would, they would go a little longer, then he would turn, and, and it always like drive up to the temple, just perfect timing. He had, was very aware of the time, and he was always there. So I always noticed that we have the tendency to skip out on so many devotional programs, where we never saw that Prabhupada said, all right, today, you know, I'll, you chant Jai Radha Madhava, and I'll come in, and I'll give the class, and you do the kirtan, I have to go. It's never like that, and it's such a perfect example that Prabhupada said, because Prabhupada knew we have that tendency, because we don't have attraction. So if he did that, we already do it anyway. What to speak of, if he was doing it, it would be even worse. So he was very vigilant about that, and he was always on time, every day, day after day after day. So that made an impression upon me. Whenever I leave the kirtan early, I always feel guilty thinking, I shouldn't do this. Prabhupada never did it. He always stayed. In 1972, the devotees started doing karmi clothes. And the main reason they did that was because they were getting kicked out of malls and they thought if they wear regular dress, let's say Western dress, if they wear Western dress, then they won't be noticed. So they found that by distributing books in Western dress, they were doing better. It was totally a byproduct. It wasn't a thought-out idea. So then, as we know, there was, at that time there was a controversy that whether we should do this or we shouldn't do this. And a lot of devotees like myself who had never done this, who had been doing straight preaching, kind of resented it, although we did it. So there was a group of us, Nishringa Chaitanya, Bir Krishna, Maharaj, myself, and a few other devotees in San Diego, who during the 1973 marathon decided we would do it in dhotis and kurtas, and the women would do it in saris. And we felt that if we had the faith, if we had the purity, we would be successful. So we started getting very good results. And we were so ecstatic, and we thought, just see, you don't need to wear Western dress. That's all a compromise. It's watered-down preaching for weaker devotees who don't have faith. So we were so ecstatic, and we were actually we were feeling very proud that we were the pure ones. You know, this, we became self-righteous. So we were very, very excited that we would write a letter to Prabhupada and tell him of our success. And we were thinking, actually, Prabhupada will, number one, he'll appreciate it, and number two, he'll tell all the other devotees, you don't have to wear Western dress. Just see, these devotees are doing just as well as you are, and they're wearing dhotis and kurtas and saris. So Prabhupada, knowing everything, being expert, he replied, he said, yes, if you cannot wear Western dress, if you do not feel comfortable in Western dress, then you can wear dhoti. So just like shatter this false pride we all had. Because you, know, you would think it would be the other way. If you don't feel comfortable in a dhoti, you can wear Western dress. He said, no, if you don't feel comfortable in Western dress, I have no objection, you can wear a dhoti. So we were kind of flattened. Our egos were totally popped. So we see how Prabhupada, he just knew the mentality of the devotees. He was so expert at just say the right thing to the right person. In 1972, when Prabhupada was first introducing the whole idea of the scientists being rascals for prop propagating evolutionary theory based on Darwin. This was all new to us. We never heard Prabhupada speaking that way. So every morning Prabhupada was going out on the morning walk and we were hearing from the devotees on the morning walk what, we was, what he was saying. We didn't know what was going on. Why Prabhupada all of a sudden out of nowhere was smashing them. Of course, that's because Srupa Damodar Maharaj was on the morning walks. So, Karandar, who was the GBC, held in Nistagosi, or, or I believe during Bhagavatam class, he had to enlighten us according to his realization while Prabhupada, while, why Prabhupada was doing this. We didn't know why. He said, he said, we all have faith in these scientists. And Prabhupada could see that we have that faith. And it's such a, <coughs> excuse me, it's such a detrimental theory for ourselves and for simple, human civilization in general that Prabhupada had to be very, very strong. Otherwise, because of our sentiment, we would 
still be attached to, to these ideas we grew up with. So it was kind of a shock to all the devotees. Every day, Prabhupada is smashing very heavily these scientists. And it was, we were new devotees. We didn't know why. And that's, that was his explanation, which was actually true, to build our faith in what he was teaching. Because he would say, what are your choices? You believe in the scientists or you believe in the Vedas? So you have to decide. What is your authority? That's the only difference. And then Prabhupada would be very blatant, very bold. They're rascals. They're cheaters. Prabhupada was giving a lecture, and the verse was about how Brahmins, women, children, elderly people are never offenders. That they should always be protected, they should always be forgiven. And that was the subject of the verse and the subject of the lecture. So during the class, children started crying. And this was right, the children started crying just right after Prabhupada was making that point that children are never offenders, Brahmins are never offenders, saintly persons are never offenders, women are never offenders. So the children start crying, and one devotee, Bahulasva, who was one of the leaders in the Berkeley Temple there, took the opportunity, as soon as Prabhupada paused, to make an announcement. And Bahulasva sometimes was a little heavy and assertive. So he very strongly said, all the children should be taken out of class immediately. They're disturbing. Something like that. It was a heavy statement. It wasn't, it wasn't an empathetic statement. It was like, just get out of here, you're disturbing Prabhupada, in so many words. So immediately Prabhupada stopped. He said, no. He said, here in this assembly we only have women, we only have children, we only have saintly persons and Brahmins, so there are no offense, no one can make any offense. And, it, and just like it mellowed the atmosphere out, and Prabhupada was just warm. And So Bahalas was telling the, the mothers to take out their crying children, and Prabhupada was saying, no, there's no offense. There are only women, children, sadhus, brahmins. There is no offense. Around 1972, there was sannyas fever. And a lot of devotees wanted to take sannyas. And in those days, sannyas meant traveling and preaching, no management. And you were given a place to stay in every temple. And you were given all the maha plates. And all you had to do was preach and travel, and you'd get a servant. So you now, now you know why everyone was asking Prabhupada to take sannyas. This form of renunciation was not really renunciation. So Prabhupada was getting letters left and right, you know, these frustrated householders, you know, having to work, maintain their families, and then they're looking at these sannyasis, traveling, getting all the maha, getting the prestige, have their own servant. They'd look at that and think, this is better than being married. So Prabhupada was getting letters left and right. So, I also sent one sannyas letter, being frustrated in household life. And Prabhupada's secretary later told me that, 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 that what the secretary would do is he would read the mail to Prabhupada, and then he would say, oh, Prabhupada, another sannyas letter, and Prabhupada would say, who? And then they would say the name, and then Prabhupada would say, yes, no. It was just like Prabhupada would know who was ready, who wasn't. So then Prabhupada would dictate to his secretary how to reply. So, so this devotee told me that when he mentioned my name, <coughs> Prabhupada replied, tell him he's a nonsense. Not yes, not no, tell him he's a nonsense. So anyway, Prabhupada wrote me back a letter and he said, first thing is you have to become a responsible householder. He said it, he, you know, the standard line, he said, you can preach in any situation, you don't need a dunda to preach. And then his main point was, that I don't want to give sannyas to anyone who has not, who has not proven themselves responsible in their ashram. Because Prabhupada didn't want to create an institution of irresponsible people, which was the basic, well, that was my mood. I can attest to that. You know, this was a great life. You just travel and preach. <laughs> Everything comes. And um, Prabhupada said, first you become responsible as a grihasta. And then when you executed your responsibilities in the Grihastra ashram, then we can c consider sanya. So Prabhupada would always give very down-to-earth practical advice to us young boys and girls. You know, most of us who joined in those days were hippies. We were just, you know, out in the clouds. And I remember the GBC writing us letters telling us, we're not spaced out hippies anymore. We have to come down to earth because that's how we would do things. We were just, we didn't know how to manage. We were like, you know, Kesarasara, everything will happen. Totally irresponsible. And Prabhupada had to ground us, and it was so difficult for him to ground many of us. So that was an example of Prabhupada trying to ground me. And still, I wrote another letter, and I asked two years later, 
And he said, all right, you can take Vonoprost. And at that time, I already had a child. So I guess I could be Vonoprost. And, and my wife, of course, she flipped. And then, you know, I was ready to just travel, and Prabhupada wrote her and said, no, I didn't mean that he just leaves and travels. And Prabhupada was just trying to encourage me. He said, Vonop Vonoprost means basically you won't have any more children, which she didn't want anymore anyway, but I took it as, all right, this is... Here are my walking papers. So that was another immature act on my part. In 1976, I got to the opportunity to travel with one of Prabhupada's secretaries who had just left his position as secretary. And he was telling me what it was like to be with Prabhupada. For those, like, for those of us like myself who didn't have a lot of association with Prabhupada personally, we would envy people who were always with him. And Prabhupada would come into the temple with his entourage, you'd go out with his entourage, you'd have darshan with his entourage, and you were just an ordinary devotee. You never got to do that. Occasionally you'd get to go on a morning walk. So you, a lot of us would envy that position, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to take sannyas, and we could just have kind of free access to Prabhupada. So this devotee made a very interesting point, and he said that after being with Prabhupada so intimately, it became difficult to see him as Sakshadhari, Twena, like Krishna, to have that awe and veneration and respect because he said Prabhupada would be very intimate with him. He would sometimes be up late at night typing letters for Prabhupada. Prabhupada would come in and just start talking about the Gaudiya Ma, talking about his past family life, like that. Just He said one time Prabhupada came up and saw that the secretary was still awake. He said, oh, you have the same disease I, I have. You can't sleep, insomnia. He said, no, Prabhupada, you can't sleep because you're Krishna conscious. And then Prabhupada would tell him intimate things. He said, yes, this is very nice. I, I can't sleep. I can hardly eat now. No question of mating, no question of defending. He said, I guess I'm liberated. He said, I always wanted to give up eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Finally, Krishna would allow me. So we'd have these intimate exchanges with Prabhupada. And he said it was becoming increasingly harder and harder to see him that way because often he would also have to take the position of mother. People would be in the room, Prabhupada, you're tired, it's time to take rest, you know, like a putting the sun to sleep. And he had a very, very difficult time after he left Prabhupada's service because of that intimacy. It's not that he was offensive to Prabhupada, but he, but he found it difficult to maintain on veneration. So then I began to appreciate my position that I didn't have that. In Prabhupada's books, he says, it's, it, there's a saying, it's better to see the deity and the spiritual master from a distance, because that way there's less chance of making offense. So those who want intimate association of their spiritual master have to be very careful. There may be a price you have to pay. So in that way, I felt, I felt maybe my position was safer, that I, I didn't have the intimate association but I had safe association. And many, many devotees who distributed books or had intimate service with Prabhupada in difficult situations would feel that my closeness with Prabhupada was through those situations. As I was saying, when I was in Vancouver and Prabhupada came in the dream, we felt very close. That's why we were there. That's why we were struggling. There was no other reason. We wouldn't have done it for ourselves. So I was... I feel that's a good realization especially for those who didn't have Prabhupada's personal association, who weren't devotees at that time. So you became less envious of him at that point? I became less envious. Actually, he had, as a result of that, he had a lot of difficulty. And for some time, he left the association of devotees because of... He had difficulty in his relationship with Prabhupada because of that. And he told me the story that that he was becoming so familiar and so overworked that he wasn't chanting his rounds. But he's very, very confident as a secretary, and Prabhupada was very attached to him. So he told Prabhupada that, you know, I don't feel I'm making spiritual advancement, I can't chant nicely, or I don't always finish my rounds. Prabhupada said, no, better you stay. Better you stay. And the next morning in class, Prabhupada's Gave, during class giving a lecture, Prabhupada looked right at him and he said, don't try to make spiritual advancement, just try to serve your spiritual master. So 
So that was the idea that he was doing wonderful service for Prabhupada. Prabhupada wanted that service and he didn't have to try to make spiritual advancement because Prabhupada was basically saying, I'll maintain you. If you can't maintain yourself, I'll maintain you. And the interesting thing was that still the devotee found it difficult. He really wanted to leave. So finally Prabhupada blessed him. You could leave. He gave him a zone, GBC zone. And maybe one or two weeks later, three weeks later, he left. So even though he wasn't chanting his rounds in Prabhupada's association, Prabhupada was maintaining him. And when he left is when he fell down, not when he was with Prabhupada. So that's a very significant point. Don't try to make spiritual advancement. Just try to serve your spiritual master. And your spiritual master will maintain you. Not that we don't try to follow and chant, but we can understand the principle. Jai <laughs> Prachur